Welcome to Sartre TV. I'm Vanessa Tyler. Today we have the honor of delving into the mind, the philosophy, and the career of a visionary in the field of workforce analytics, Kevin Oakes, who is the CEO of Institute for Corporate Productivity, better known as I4CP, a real cool name. Well, Kevin came clear across the country to be in our New York studios with us today. Kevin's mission is to teach us what companies must know and must practice for survival. Kevin, thank you for making the trip from Washington State to be with us here today. My pleasure. You've been studying, analyzing, and pumping renewed energy into the lifeblood of today's companies, its employees. Uh, what drove you to this line of work? <laughs> um, I mean, I probably got into it by accident, but I've always felt that people are the most important aspect of, of a company. Uh, and you hear that a lot from from CEOs and senior leaders, but often it's lip service. And uh, what I love are companies that really uh, embrace their employees and invest a lot in their development, invest a lot in the acquisition of the right kinds of employees. And so I think that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. That's an art, isn't it? There's a science to that. It's not, it's not easy, even though, like you said, it's lip service, but it's not easy for a company to do that. No, you know, it's, it's funny, Vanessa. They, it takes a lot of effort, um, so there are elements of science to this, and that's what we do. We provide research on the people practices of high-performing organizations. And so we're constantly looking at what are the aspects of those people practices that are different in top-performing companies versus low-performing companies. And there's almost always a big difference, which should tell you something right there. Uh, but there is an art to it. You know, we're talking about people, and um, people are not always logical and not always easy to figure out. And so it's a fun area of company life because we're, you know, looking at some of the research side, but also the non-scientific part of it and what can uh, companies do better. What can companies do better? I mean, it, it sounds great, but I know it's not as simple as, as that. I mean, is it a one, two, three? What can companies do better? I think more and more companies are recognizing that they need to be a bit more organized around their talent in their organization uh, and have systems in place that really leverage that talent. Uh, somebody tweeted out uh, the other day, you know, what, what's the list for creating a great company? It was one people and then there was nothing else after it. <laughs> and that's what I resonate with because it really is all about the people. And so companies you know, need to source uh, the right kind of talent to begin with and put a lot of effort into finding that right kind of talent uh, right up front. But then from cradle to grave you know, is a common expression. You know, are you developing that talent? Are you growing mm -hmm. that talent? Are you moving that talent around, which is often a, a little used uh, development technique? It, when that talent leaves, are you uh, accounting for that? Are you looking at the succession plan for that talent? Uh, you look at any great company and you're going to find that they put a lot of effort into that equation. Yeah. Um, generally we call it talent management and uh, you know I think uh, managing that process, managing talent management from cradle to grave is, is critically important. A talent, an employee should come, obviously they come with education, mm -hmm. um, but beyond that are you looking for more or will it be up to the company to try to cultivate it as you say? Oftentimes these questions are hard to answer when it's generic and not specific to an industry or to, or to certain kinds of companies. Uh, but generally companies are looking for uh, people coming in that have the right competencies, have the right skills. There's a lot of work being put into assessment right now of candidates. Not so much from a generic perspective, but really kind of fingerprinting what does success look like inside our organization and can we uh, assess people to see what's their likelihood of being successful in the company. But it shouldn't stop there. Once somebody comes in, uh, you should continue to develop and to grow them uh, going forward. One of the things that I've always said about talent coming in though, we oftentimes gather some great data about that talent. We understand their strengths and that's why we're going to hire them. Uh, but we also uncover some stuff about their weaknesses and their skills deficiencies. Uh, in many large companies today, all that data gets thrown in the trash the moment we hire that person, when in reality it should be passed on to other functions. So when you know about their skills deficiencies, that should go over to the learning and development group. And uh, you should also be populating the performance management system you know, with some of that so that the manager knows what to work on with that particular employee. And lastly, many employees come into an organization with skills that maybe don't apply to the job we hired them for. Maybe you know how to speak Mandarin Chinese, but it's not 
critical for the job that you're in right now. But boy, wouldn't it be great if we knew that you knew, you knew how to speak Mandarin Chinese, then when we open up that new China office, you know, we can look inside our talent database and find out, okay, who can help us here? And that's a, another piece of data that often goes missing when people uh, get hired into an organization. So what I'm always particularly interested in are organizations that gather that data and use that data to make the company itself more productive, more efficient, uh, and just more effective overall. It sounds like many companies are probably letting go a lot of good candidates. They're kind of maybe not hiring them because they're looking for something specific without looking overall. I was just at uh, LinkedIn's headquarters last week and we had a meeting of heads of talent acquisition from a number of Fortune 500 companies and this was the conversation we were having. It's how can they use talent analytics better to identify the best candidates right up front coming in. There's an old saying uh, that you can teach a turkey to climb a tree but why not just hire a squirrel instead? And that's what you know. a lot of organizations, if you can start with the right candidate to begin with, then the development and their progression becomes so much easier after that. Was this your first choice of going into business? And we kind of know a little bit that may, may have been your second, but was it your first <laughs> choice, the business that you're in? Um, I, no, I got here really um, by accident, like I said. So I was, um, right out of school, I was working at an investment company and then, an, and then I moved to an insurance company. And, I basically woke up one day and said, you know, insurance is not my career long term. And so my father, uh, who was a very successful businessman, was also thinking about switching careers. And so it was a rare opportunity where father and son could say, hey, maybe we should go do something together. And that's exactly what we did. We, uh, we, but we didn't know at the time exactly what we wanted to do. So we started looking at different uh, industries and businesses. And I bumped into an organization that was doing interactive video training on Laserdisc. This is before the web. This is before CD-ROM even. And I fell in love with the whole concept of interactive video training. And so we began repping the products and services of a company that was doing that. But pretty soon the CD-ROM came around and so we morphed to the CD-ROM and I started building an e-learning business. And uh, woke up one day and had a pretty big e-learning business and that's what got me into human capital to, to begin with. How are HR relationships changing? What is the best recruiting method for attracting just the right talent? Well, like I said, so talent an analytics um, is becoming a very big segment of human capital overall. Uh, and we're only scratching the surface. So many companies are just beginning to realize that through better data analysis, they can not only stand to understand who are the right candidates, but then who succeeds once they come into the organization. We call that quality of hire, and there's a lot of ways to look at it. Some companies maybe value longevity, others would value uh, how quickly somebody comes up to productivity, we call that time to productivity, others might value other traits. But it all you know, gets lumped into the banner of quality of hire. And I think the more that organizations understand what does quality of hire look like in our organization, then that should feed into where are we going to find our best candidates. One of the, our member companies would only recruit from 16 colleges and universities, for example, until they realized that those other people that somehow infiltrated their company uh, that didn't go to one of those 16 colleges or universities uh, they were successful too, in fact, maybe more successful. And so that opened their eyes to, hey, we're really limiting the talent pool that we go after. Uh, we're probably limiting the diversity that we have in the organization too. You can get pretty homogenous if you're only going uh, to you know, the same sources of talent. So I think more and more organizations recognize the importance of diversity because it's, it's not about uh, gender or race, it's really about diversity of thought. Can we get more ideas from different perspectives inside our organization uh, and get more creative, get more innovative because we have that diversity of thought in the organization. So I think when it comes to talent acquisition, sourcing the right candidates, using analytics, looking for diversity to become very important for companies. Succession that you talked about of talent uh, as you bring them into the company, I wonder how open many of the managers are to that concept because in effect you're kind of bringing someone in to replace yourself in a sense if you're doing it right. right. How open are, is management to such a, an idea? It depends on the manager um, but the company can do a number of things to reinforce the importance of that. 
there are certainly managers that uh, they derive a lot of personal um, satisfaction from their own power, right? So the more powerful and, and the more reliant the, the division or department or company is on me, uh, that makes some managers feel great. Okay. And that's kind of human nature. But that's very destructive for the company. And that's a trait that we see in low-performing companies where they allow managers to be powerful by not sharing their own knowledge and also not sharing the talent, hoarding the talent that's in their organization. Uh, so companies that I think have broken through that, they not only put a lot of emphasis on succession planning and, and make sure that managers have thought through who is your ultimate successor so that you create managers who when they leave, they get more satisfaction out of the fact that they're going to be okay that I've left. You know, they're, I've left them in good shape versus managers who leave chaos behind them uh, when they leave. But also managers who are promoting talent uh, that are in their organization. We did a recent study on talent mobility, for example, and that's a, a definite trait of top companies. They do a very good job at moving talent around in their organization. They don't let especially top talent become stagnant inside you know, a division or department. Again, that's allowing managers to hoard talent, and it's ultimately destructive to the company. And the way you get around that, so managers who naturally want to do that, you reward and make a big deal about managers that are developing talent in their division or department and allowing that talent to move. And when you make that visible, uh, when you reward it, either just through recognition, some, maybe there's monetary recognition around it, you suddenly change the culture a bit so that that is uh, something that's acceptable inside the company. And then the managers that are moving talent, they eventually understand that they become a talent magnet for good talent. Because you as an employee, you want to go work for the guy that's going to get you promoted or the gal that's going to move you inside the company, not somebody that's just going to you know, keep you under their thumb. So that, that's an aspect of definite, you know, definite aspect of top companies. And therefore, that, those managers become more successful as a result. They, they have the best. So it's, uh, it's So it's an interesting. education process yeah. and maybe a rewiring process for some managers' mindsets. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for some companies, it's just a, you know, a, a, a cut line kind of, um, you know, initiative so that if managers don't acquiesce to that, then they're probably not the right managers for your organization and you've got to move on. What is more important for an organization, a laser focus or the flexibility of, for out-of-the-box thinking? Meaning, of course, you, you kind of want everybody to be all on the same team. You don't want somebody who's totally right. you know, different. But I'm wondering, how do you have the, the benefit of both? <laughs> well, my company, I've said this many times inside my own organization, uh, but a favorite phrase I have for startups that I think applies to a lot of companies is that most startups uh, don't starve, they drown meaning they have so many ideas and so many things that they're trying to pursue that they never get real focus on what matters and what's important uh, in mm -hmm. the company. So I'm a big believer in focus. I think focus is critical, but not so much that you stifle innovation. And so I think it's hard to choose between focus and out-of-the-box thinking. Ultimately, you want out-of-the-box thinking. You want creativity, much like I said around diversity of thought. You want those diverse ideas in the company. Uh, but then you have to pick, and you've got to settle on what's important to us as an organization, what, are, what is the company going to rally around, and that's where focus becomes critical. Is it hard to convince an underperforming organization of the value of talent programs? I know these programs are valuable, but they're probably expensive. Um, and if you have a company that's already doing poorly, how could you convince them of the value of investing? in these type of programs? When a company is not performing, I think it is sometimes hard to convince them of the value of talent because they're in survival mode, uh, typically. Um, and I've seen too many senior executives and CEOs uh, very quickly cut budgets for talent programs, for learning programs, because the organization is in survival mode. Um, that said, they probably got to where they were because they didn't do that in the first place. <laughs> they didn't invest in the people to begin with. And there are some great examples. I remember Sun Microsystems, Scott McNeely used to uh, always feel that when there was a downturn, and there's always going to be downturns, the last thing he wanted to do was cut development programs. 
wow. uh, because he wanted to keep you know progressing. He knew there'd be an upturn, and I want to keep uh, you know the employees that we have that we rely on. I want to keep them engaged, but I want to make them even better when that upturn occurs. So I think the way you convince uh, companies to not do that is through data and through good case studies, and uh, you know it's, that's what my company does in general. Mastering talent management is core to a company's survival, as we just said. How is technology useful in the unbiased recruiting? There's been some interesting experiments around um, taking the picture of an applicant out, as well as you know, no video of the applicant out, and just looking at applicants side by side based on their merits and how that changes people's opinion. And most humans, they get influenced, right, by appearance, by mannerisms. So I am kind of fascinated by that. And I think technology today is doing a better job at uncovering uh, people who have the right competencies that you're looking for and the right skills that you're looking for, but maybe aren't coming from the traditional places that you had found that in the past. I think LinkedIn's been a great revolution in that regard. Um, it's allowing people to really showcase some of their capabilities and some of their skills. More than anything, what LinkedIn has done is allowed companies to find passive candidates, you know, people who are not actively looking for a job, which are typically your better candidates, frankly, uh, who are in an organization and would be right for your company. So I think technology has definitely helped. Um, there was, a, again, a good debate at this LinkedIn meeting that we had last week around, could you automate the entire process, right? Just put somebody through, pick them based on their profile, put them through an assessment, you know, and basically automate the whole thing without them even ever talking to somebody. I think that's a bit extreme, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we all agreed, yeah, it probably could be done right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the technology exists where that could happen. Um, I do think that we're getting better from a, a diversity standpoint and finding uh, you know, different kinds of people to come into the organization, different backgrounds, finding it from different sources. It's all helping organizations in, in general. I'm thinking it's almost that way now when you think many of the organizations you have to apply through the portal. So you're kind right. of already in an automated process to apply for a job. You're you not... are, and there are companies that I've worked with, uh, vendors in the space, yes. that based on what you're doing in the portal, how many times you go back and visit it, what you go look at, uh, that's cluing the company in to the types of candidates that they want to focus on. For a company, it's all about winnowing it down. You know, how can I winnow it down to the right people uh, that are applying to my company? Because I'm working with some organizations that get a million or millions of applicants per year, and yeah, it's pretty daunting to try to, you know, <laughs> cipher through who you want uh, out of you know out of that many applicants per year. That's interesting information. So as the t number of times you apply to the portal or check back, that's registered and that is kind of flagged it, by the company? <laughs> that's interesting. It, it can be, yes. If you're using the right technology, it can be. And uh, that's where a couple of vendors in the space are, have, have gone and some companies are doing that today. Because it shows you're interested. It yeah. shows you're aggressive. How many times does this person come back and visit the portal? What did they go read about our company? Uh, what are they doing when they're, you know, on the on the portal? So all of that is data that the company can use as part of the selection process. Why is it that one in five organizations effectively master talent management? Just one in five. There's a lot of factors there. I think um, what you find in most companies uh, when you're trying to reorg um, a group or a department or division, there's going to be politics involved and. I always think that the companies that have the best talent management practices, they've got a strong talent leader uh, in place, um, but that talent leader has to have control over different aspects of the strategic side of talent management. By strategic side, I'm, I'm kind of leaving out payroll and some of the transactional aspects that HR gets involved in, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about talent acquisition, learning and development, performance management, succession. Those are all you know, the strategic areas. There's others that are part of it. And the key there, I think, is sharing data from each one of those. You know, Back to my example about the data being thrown out uh, on the talent acquisition side, the more you can share data between those functions and that those functions can work cooperatively, the better off you are. Yeah. So I've seen in some companies, they're combining the talent development um, role with talent acquisition 
because who better to know what skills were lacking inside this organization than talent development? So if you're feeding that back to talent acquisition, now you have a, a better idea of the kinds of skills and competencies that you're looking for you know, in new employees. Mm -hmm. uh, so talent management is somewhat hard to integrate in a company. It does take focus. It takes, I think, r support from senior leadership. The good news is more and more CEOs get it. More and more CEOs are supportive of this process, and they understand that ultimately it just means they're going to be more profitable and uh, you know, productive organization if they can get this right. Culture. Mm -hmm. Creating culture. Right. A good place to work? Is it more than just making a lot of money? Yeah, so culture is um, the, probably the most amorphous thing we study because uh, it's, um, uh, you know, a lot of companies will say uh, we have a very distinctive culture, but if you interview 100 people, they're going to have 100 different uh, ways that they describe what the culture is. Uh, it, it's like an onion, you know, the more layers you peel back, it gets a little bit different. You know, there are tribes within cultures, so, you know, if you're in one division, you know, the culture is probably a little different than another division versus the overall organization. Ultimately, the best companies, they have great cultures, and oftentimes it stems from the top, uh, and the leader sets the tone for the culture. Not always, but many times. And I think we can see that in, uh, you know, most of those great companies, there's one aspect that I always feel is present, and that's transparency. And, and if I ever get asked by friends, hey, you talk to a lot of companies, you know, wh what do you find about those companies? My first reaction is a little bit of a joke. I'll say, uh, number one, all companies think they're unique. <laughs> but number two, the best companies are transparent. And there's no secrets. Um, they're very uh, clear on what they're trying to accomplish as an organization. A good test of transparency that I often do in large audiences is I ask, how many of you have a high potential program inside your organization? And a lot of hands will go up. And then I'll ask, in, of your high potential programs, how many of those programs are transparent? Meaning that people understand what does it take to be a high potential versus not? And do the people in your high potential programs even know they're in the program? And I get a lot of chuckles around that because oftentimes they don't. And, pe and we've labeled people as high potential, but we don't tell them. That's not being transparent, and the best companies, I think, even go to that level of transparency where they make it very clear, you know, what, it, what does it take to be in this hypo program. That's just one small example, but, you know, culture really does um, revolve around transparency in many of the greatest companies in the world. It's interesting when you talk with people and they say, oh, this is a great place to work, and you, you wonder what they're talking about, you know. Could be the food, could be they get to play foosball at the break, you know. Everybody has a, you know, different definition of what a great place to work is. But if you enjoy going to work, um, if you're clear on how your job contributes to the success of the organization, generally you're going to put in the extra effort. And, and that's what a lot of you know, employee engagement is a topic we talk about a lot. That's what a lot of engagement is about, is putting in discretionary effort. You know, Gallup came out with the Gallup 12 a number of years ago uh, to try to determine uh, what's an engaged workforce or not. One of the questions they had in there that they felt was really pivotal is, do you have a best friend at work? Now, if you have a best friend at work, you probably are pretty happy about work. Uh, not always, but you probably are. But that's a pretty hard thing for a corporation to help with, right? I can't help you get a best friend at work. What I can create is a very inclusive environment uh, I can create a transparent environment. I can create an environment where it's clear that we reward certain behaviors, that we want you to grow as an individual. All of those things are very important, particularly for the young uh, population coming into workforces today. They've probably placed more emphasis on some of those aspects than previous generations have. There are so many different generations in our workplaces today. Uh, first of all, how many generations are there? And then I want to ask you, millennials, how do we deal with them in today's workplace? There's probably four generations uh, in the workplace today, uh, maybe even five, uh, depending on <laughs> how you count them. Uh, so you've got the older generation, which has been called a number of different things. The, the biggest generation that has traditionally been in the workforce has been the baby boomers, mm -hmm. then Gen X, uh, then millennials, which has gotten a lot of ink, 
And we even have, just starting to enter the workforce now, Gen Z, and we just did a report on Gen Z. A little bit of debate on when does you know, millennials end and when does Gen Z start. I find um, looking at the differences in generations kind of interesting, but I also have a, a visceral negative reaction to it as well. I think it's really unfair to stereotype people just on the year they were born, <laughs> or the you know, several years they were born. We, we talk a lot about millennials in the workplace, but if you talked about any other kind of uh, you know, race or gender in the same way we talk about millennials, you know, you'd be vilified, right? But for some reason, it's okay to talk about generations the way we talk about them. Uh, there's a great book called uh, Unfairly Labeled uh, that was written by a millennial, uh, and, and we're Jessica Creel, and we're having Jessica speak at uh, my conference uh, in a few months. And she does a great job of talking about how we shouldn't just broad brush you know, a generation. Now that said, I think what's most interesting are generations' perceptions of each other. And we've done some research around that where we ask millennials, what's your perception of Gen X and baby boomers around a number of different aspects? We ask the other generations the same about millennials and, you know, and then cross tabulate, you know, what are all these people saying about each other? And there are some distinct differences in how um, generations view each other which is probably more useful when you talk about how can we make sure you know, these generations work well together. Now, kind of getting away from my you know, unfairly labeled part, <laughs> I do think that there's more of an emphasis today with millennials on you know, certain aspects of work, right? Um, is the company I'm working for uh, socially responsible is much more important to that generation as a whole than it was to previous generations. How quickly am I going to be developed? Uh, how quickly am I going to move inside this organization? Uh, are also traits that are more prevalent in, with millennials. And then I think the, the notion that I'm going to be with this company for the rest of my life, that went out a long time ago, right? So it's not something that many millennials think about. They think this is a stepping stone in my life. I'd like to have a coach. I'd probably like to have several coaches and mentors while I'm at this company. Uh, but you know, eventually I will move on. So all of those aspects, I think, have to be uh, at the forefront of an organization's mind when they're bringing in uh, millennials into the workforce. One of the, the biggest things that you found in, in studying the, the generations in the workplace, the biggest difference that you found that uh, could help employers who are, you know, have someone's been there for 25 years, 30 years, someone's just uh, graduating from college and entering the, the company. It's very clear that development is uh, crucial to uh, new generations coming in. I had the uh, CEO of an insurance company tell me a story uh, last year. His, his daughter graduated from a great school, got a great job in financial services. He talked with her about uh, a year after she'd been in the job and said, how's it going? And she said, well, Dad, I quit just a couple weeks ago. He's like, well, what do you mean? Why did you quit? She's like, well, I got a new manager a few weeks ago. It was very clear to me that this manager was not going to be developing me. He didn't care about my development, and I need somebody to care about my development, so I quit. And he was incredulous that she would quit without another job, that she would just quit, but she was pretty confident, I'll find another job, but it's more important to me to be someplace where I can grow as an individual than not. And I think that's a, an important lesson for companies. They've got to invest in the growth and development and at least show uh, a, a path to development uh, for new employees coming in. When you have talent development uh, in the company versus a direct mentor, which one would you think would be most valuable for um, an employee, especially a millennial? I think they're both important and you know this doesn't have to be expensive uh, developing employees. Sure. So if you're if you have a peer-to-peer -peer mentor, or a coach within the organization, that really doesn't cost the organization anything. Um, but you have to help people find each other, right? There are companies out there that it's basically Match.com for mentoring. You know, they're lining people up uh, based on their interests, based on their skills and competencies. And I think that's a very nice development methodology um, within an organization. Probably the best source of knowledge within your organization, though, are the employees themselves. So mm -hmm. if you can uh, give them the tools and the methods to share that knowledge, and get rewarded for sharing that knowledge, uh, then you as an organization uh, ha are becoming a learning culture and it probably doesn't cost a whole lot because you, you, don't, 
you don't have to run expensive classrooms and uh, bring in you know outside courseware to teach your employee population. You can really just leverage the knowledge of the workforce. How do we create the employee excitement in a company? Nothing substitutes for success. So I, I think first and foremost, you've got to focus on the success of the organization. And that means you've got to be execution focused as a company. It gets back to our laser focus that you asked about earlier. Uh, if the company's succeeding, employees you know, are succeeding, and they're going to be excited coming to work every day knowing that they're succeeding. Uh, Jack Welch said many, many years ago, mm -hmm. celebrate everything. And I think there's a good element to that, too. You've got to celebrate those successes, maybe go a little overboard sometimes <laughs> in celebrating those successes. Mm -hmm. But I think employees need to keep being reminded about you know, where the company and the organization is succeeding. Beyond that, I, you know, I think some of those things help uh, in Silicon Valley, you know, it's uh, pretty common to have free food, uh, you've got the foosball and the ping pong tables everywhere, you know, there's a lot of collaboration spaces, that's great, but if the company isn't succeeding overall, you know, that all seems kind of hollow. Uh, so putting that in, uh, coupling it with success will make for great environments. You know, I just really believe in that transparency aspect that I said before. The more transparent you can be, the better. You want everybody to be on the same page about what it takes to win in our organization. And if you're not, you want them to be on the same page about why we're not winning. And, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, they'll end up being happy if they feel like they're, the company believes in them, you know, and then they'll believe in the company as well. In a lot of larger organizations that have been around for a while, it's important to tell stories. The culture of an organization can get really uh, morphed quickly the bigger you get as, uh, as an organization. Uh, and so in those organizations that are growing rapidly, the better storytelling you do, uh, the more of those original things that made you successful will remain throughout the, the company's culture. And so, you know, if it's bringing bagels in and coffee in, that's great. You know, you, sh you should do that. Uh, but there are a lot of little things that companies can do to, to, you know, make their employees feel wanted and welcome. You have left your mark on many companies. May I state the highlights from your bio? Okay. Uh, before CEO of I4CP, you created Sum Total Systems, the world's largest learning management system company and the industry's leading provider of talent development solutions. What did Sum Total, uh, how did it become such a force under your leadership? And what was it about its specific approach to employee development? Some total has gone through you know a lot of iterations over the years, but uh, originally I was running a company called Click to Learn um, that I merged with another company called Docent. Um, at the time, there were three main providers of learning management systems in the space: the two of us and then uh, a, a third company. And it became very clear that two of us had to get together to you know, be a leader in the space. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be the one left out. So <laughs> I started talking to the other two companies about, uh, about merging. And so we ultimately merged with Docent. Because we were very similar in size um, from all aspects, from revenue, from market cap, we were both public companies, uh, to, uh, to number of employees. Uh, we decided it would be best to treat this as a merger of equals and create a new company identity, which was some total. Now, I was told along the way, there's no such thing as a merger of equals. There's all, you know, somebody always wins. Uh, looking back, I can, I can truly say that was a merger of equals. We kept the best of the best and um, didn't have much ego about whose product survived, which Salesforce, you know, was the winner, which uh, executives, you know, won out. We just really tried to create the best company we could, and I, I think we did a great job at that. And um, you know, some total as, as an organization has continued on. It's now mm -hmm. part of Skillsoft, but it's a uh, you know it's a learning management and talent management system uh, that has done a great job over the years. I wanted to say a footnote about Click to Learn, the company that was founded by uh, Paul Allen. Uh, co-founder yeah. of Microsoft, and I wanted to find out from you, what did you learn by working with him? So the history is I, I had bootstrapped my uh, initial company that I talked about uh, in e-learning, and that was called Oaks Interactive. Uh, and we became one of the bigger e-learning companies in the US. We were doing work with several different companies, one of which was the first company Paul Allen founded after Microsoft, and at the time it was called Asymmetrics. And this was in the mid-90s, and Paul approached us and said, 
hey, look, I'd really like to IPO this company, but we, you know, we'd like to be um, bigger. We'd like to have more uh, products and services. Why don't we join forces and then let's try to IPO the company? And so that's exactly what we did. We joined, we merged the two organizations. We IPO'd in '98. I very quickly became CEO uh, of the company and later chairman of the company, but we changed our name to Click to Learn uh, right after we IPO'd. And uh, Paul was on the board um, and was very active, and uh, he's a great guy. He, uh, Paul is a very generous man. Um, he's a visionary. Yeah. I think probably the you know one criticism that he's heard many times is he's too early, uh, which mm -hmm. is sort of a backhanded compliment. But uh, <laughs> he's such a, a visionary that you know oftentimes he sees things well before others do. Uh, but Paul was a, a great asset, and we as a young company, I think, got access to a number of things uh, because of Paul and who he was and what he had created, you know, that most startup companies, you know, or, or pre-IPO and just post-IPO companies don't have access to. So it was, uh, yeah, it was great working with Paul and having him on the board of directors at the time. And obviously his philosophy falls, falls right into with your philosophy in terms of the, um, the emphasis on employee training and the employees, employees, employees that would be the key to success for business. He's always been a big believer in that. And uh, so that predecessor organization, Asymmetrics, um, had created uh, employee learning tools, uh, and he was a big proponent of development of employees. So yes, his philosophy fit right in with you know, what ultimately uh, we created. What are more the more interactive ways to engage with employees to cultivate and sustain top talent? I think the more you can involve employees in the development process, the better, and maybe even involve managers. We've seen that in leadership development programs, uh, that if you are involving the managers in the design uh, and development of the program, as well as the delivery, uh, you'll get more buy-in uh, from those managers. We just did a um, research report on leaders as teachers. Uh, and. This is a concept that's not necessarily new. Again, Jack Welsh did this many years ago at Crotonville. Um, but there are many organizations that make it part of the job of a new leader coming in that you will also be a teacher. And I often coach um, L&D departments uh, in organizations that if you don't have a Leaders as Teachers program, think about getting one installed because there's not only a number of benefits to the students they get access to, you know, the executives of the organization, they get probably more communication, more vision, more alignment. The leaders themselves get a lot out of it. They get mm -hmm. to meet a lot of people that maybe they don't, you know, normally get to meet in the organization. Uh, they get to hear um, maybe things that they don't normally get to hear, too, uh, from people who are uh, coming to courses. For the L&D department, they get more buy-in from, you know, the managers themselves, uh, and they get more budget, typically, uh, for their programs. So leaders how, as but teachers. But how does that look? Is that like a monthly uh, meeting, a retreat? How, how does that manifest? It can manifest itself in, in multiple ways. So, you know, the way that some companies like a GE or Boeing do it, they have very big leadership centers and they're running courses, traditional courses, and leaders are coming in and they are the instructor for the course. Okay. Other times it can be done over technology. So if you have virtual classrooms, you know, they can be leading a virtual classroom. Uh, in the organization. So there's, there's different ways you can do it. The important thing is, can I get my leaders involved directly teaching curriculum and, and getting their input into curriculum uh, that we want to impart in, uh, to the employee base? You recently blogged uh, about a term you felt was overused <coughs> a lot in the business. The term is game changer. Um, Why did you have a problem with that <laughs> term, which everyone uses now? Yeah, I know. Uh, everything's a game changer, and if not using it, what would you? How would you describe the high performing performing talent in in the business? <laughs> so I was being a bit tongue in cheek with a game changer uh, title, but it certainly caught some attention. Uh, you see it on uh, TV ads. Uh, in, uh, just there are words that come into our lexicon that get faddish, you know, and so now we've overused that word, game changer. But I think in, you know, that is what companies are generally looking for in their high potential talent. They want somebody that is going to help reinvent their organization or continue to foster whatever made that organization unique and uh, propel that organization overall. There's an old adage that the most expensive attrition you can have in the company is, is uh, year one attrition. 
Uh, I firmly believe that it's your high potential attrition that's the most expensive. If you're losing high potential talent in your organization, you're losing the lifeblood, the future of your organization. Uh, and so companies need to pay attention to that. They need to pay attention to who truly is uh, going to be a leader long term in this organization. And what those people want to feel is pretty simple stuff. They want to feel like you're developing in me, but I also want to, if I'm high potential talent, I want to feel like I'm in the know, that I'm uh, part of the strategy of the organization, that I know what's going on, that I have input into the strategy of the organization so that long term, uh, you know, I'm going to evolve to be one of the leaders of this organization. So I use that term game changer, you know, a little loosely, but, uh, you know, I'm, I was trying to make a point around the importance of high potential talent. I think people are loyal if, if they feel loyalty back. I agree. Yeah. It's um, loyalty goes both ways. <laughs> so, you know, a company has to be loyal to its employees and uh, a company wants to see employees loyal to, the, to them. We often only talk about it one way. We only talk about you know company loyalty to an employee, um, but I think organizations, if they feel loyalty from employees back, that goes a long way as well. Another huge deal in your impressive history is as past chair and member of the board of the American Society of Training and Development. Uh, that association is dedicated to workplace performance. Yep. What were your personal goals with that organization, and did you achieve them when you were there? Yeah, ASTD is uh, one of the largest uh, learning and development associations in the world, and they changed their name actually to ATD uh, just a couple of years ago. So today it's the Association of Talent Development. And it's for uh, individuals who are in that profession. And uh, I had the good fortune of being on the board of directors uh, for three years, and then they asked me to chair the board, so I spent another two years, one as chair-elect and one as chair. And uh, to this day, continue to do a lot of work with ATD, so our organization does a great deal of research for ATD, um, and has been for the last, I think, six or seven years. And what I love about ATD is that they've been very true to uh, developing talent in an organization. They have created a, a great association of members uh, that are dedicated to that. What we as I4CP are doing is trying to call out um, different uh, methodologies, different programs that we not only view as best practices, but what we do as a company is look at next practices in organizations. And we define next practice as something that we can clearly see is correlated to bottom line business impact but not a lot of companies are yet doing it. So it's a call out to organizations to say, hey, you should be thinking about this. You should be looking at this. And I think uh, our research with ATD calls that out. I think ATD as an association does a good job of, of calling that out as well. So uh, I continue to be involved with ATD and really support what they're doing. What processes can be used that continuously assess talent needs in an organization? And can you elaborate with an example? You know, I think it's important um, to understand as a company not only what your financial risk is but also what your talent risk is. Mm -hmm. And we actually are just coming out with a report now on talent risk. And it's a term that I've been fortunate to see used at a couple Fortune 500 board meetings uh, where the board is, is examining talent risk overall. Now talent risk can take different shapes. Mm -hmm. It could be what risk do we have with the talent we have um, it can also be what risk do we have as we go into emerging markets, as we go into new markets, grow new products, what risk do we have of not being able to acquire the right talent or develop the right talent to lead us in those new products or to run those emerging markets uh, for us. There are some companies that I've worked with that have also reassessed uh, some bets that they made on talent early on. I think a good example is India. A lot of companies invested heavily in talent in India 10, 15 years ago. India's changed a lot since then, you know, so is it still the right, you know, place for us as an organization to continue to invest in talent, you know, or are we supposed to, you know, look elsewhere to, to invest in talent? And I've, I've been involved in conversations with companies around that as well. I think all of it just it means you're looking at talent uh, very introspectively. You're looking at it as an asset to your company. So when we talk about talent needs, uh, it's important to think about how does that impact the bottom line of our organization? Because ultimately, that's what you're trying to do. The more you can relate 
our talent development efforts, our talent acquisition efforts, anything around talent to bottom line business impact, you know, the, the, I think the clearer you're going to be about what makes sense for us as an organization. And a talent risk sounds like something that you're thinking about for the future as well. It's very future focused. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of the best companies um, do a lot of scenario planning um, and they, they spend a lot of time talking about the future. Um, they do that by scanning the environment, not being too insular and only thinking about ourselves. But I think a good exercise for any company is to take some of your best people and uh, ask them to create the company that will kill your company. <laughs> that way you can you know, think about you know, what, what are the threats to us as an organization? What are we missing? Are we, going, are we Blockbuster and didn't see Netflix you know, coming along, right? That's, you know, and had Blockbuster done that, had they said, you know, what, what, would, what would kill us as an organization? They would have thought up Netflix. And you know, they didn't necessarily have to create Netflix, but they would have known that that threat was around the corner. How can action learning programs help develop an internal pool in an organization? Action learning is taking an existing, a real issue, and um, having uh, people in a learning environment work on that real issue. And I think it's a great thing for high potential talent. I think it's a great thing for emerging leaders uh, to have action learning as part of their development efforts because you're, you're killing two birds with one stone in one sense, but you're also giving them some great experience. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. As I am simulations, uh, and we just did another study on that uh, recently for ATD, looking at the power of simulations and experiential learning. That's a great way for emerging leaders to uh, really understand what it's like to be in certain roles and positions. Uh, it's a relatively inexpensive thing when you just talk about experiential learning, um, but simulations can get expensive. Uh, so companies have to weigh, you know, what are the, you know, the costs and the benefits around that. Is that simply just changing roles or role playing? What exactly would it entail? They can, so you can do role playing, but I've, there, there are also very expensive simulations that you can put people into. There are computer simulations that, uh, you know, put them in the environment, immerse them in the environment that they are going to be in. There are business simulations that maybe aren't quite as expensive, but you're working through uh, real business problems. Uh, and as a team, you know, trying to understand what it's going to take to solve that problem. Hmm. Uh, so simulations can be very, very effective, but it's a broad topic that uh, sometimes people get lost in because there's a lot of different nuances to it. Citing an example, can you share with us how does succession planning and maintaining talent pool go hand in hand? One of the next practices that we found in top companies is using assessments, particularly psychological assessments, with existing employees as opposed to just employees coming into the organization. Mm. And companies that were using that for succession planning tended to be off the charts high performing organizations. Uh, so that was, that was a, a next practice that we thought uh, was something a lot of companies should take a look at. I do think that there are a number of companies that do a good job at succession planning overall. Um, we, you know, we work with a lot of large companies that are growing very rapidly. So I mentioned LinkedIn before, but you know, even companies like a Microsoft or an Amazon uh, in the tech sector, you know, they've got to think about succession planning and, yeah. and really have good broad talent pools from which to pull from. I think those organizations you know, are, are thinking long and hard about it, um, doing a lot of work around it. The better you can be at creating those talent pools and having that bench strength as an organization, the more prepared you are uh, for you know, future developments. There's so much change in the world. The more agile a corporation is, the more successful they're going to be long term. And we've also done quite a bit of research around corporate agility and something like succession planning is just one aspect of being an agile organization overall. You were terrific. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. We learned so much from you. Thank Thanks. you. And I'm Vanessa Tyler. Join us next time when we interview the leading thinkers of today on Sartre TV.